Hello, everyone. Hi, we're live. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Uh, my name is Nadia Rosli. I'm from Internews Malaysia. Um, we are the ones who organize this uh, webinar together with the European Union and the National Union of Journalists. Um, can everyone hear? Uh, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, right. Before we dive into this topic, um, just a brief introduction on uh, Internews Malaysia and what this webinar is about. So um, just some ground rules or formalities, um, just in terms of the flow for this particular webinar. So the first um, five to 10 minutes, uh, I'll make it very short. Uh, it will be introduction from me and Internews and you know what we're doing. And then after that, we'll go straight to Dr. Faisal as the first speaker who has 10 minutes, followed by Fun Fong and also Ida. So the next half an hour will be the second part of the webinar. And after that will be the Q&A, which will be about 30 minutes, um, 30 to 40 minutes. So if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please um, put them into the Ask a Question tab, if you can see uh, on your screen, and then we will address those um, with our speakers. So hang on a minute, okay. Let me share my screen. Okay, um, let me just introduce um, who Internews is. So, Internews is an international non profit. Uh, we are an organization dedicated to giving people worldwide the news and information they need, the ability to connect, and the means to make their voices heard. Since its formation in 1982, Internews has worked in more than 100 countries worldwide. Today, Internews has active projects in more than 80 countries throughout Africa, the Americas, Asia, Europe, and Eurasia, and the Middle East. Internews in Malaysia is currently, um, we're having media development projects. Uh, including Ayo Belia, The Diverse Voice, and Suara Masyarakat or Community Voices. Suara Masyarakat is supported by the EU and aims to build the capacity of Malaysian journalists to deliver high qualitative investigative and data journalism on reform processes in the country and develop community information media and networks to improve governance by providing two-way communication between citizens and local authorities. To implement this, Internews Malaysia team will be coordinating with our following partners. So the first partner is Souls 24-7 or Science of Life Studies. They are an award-winning not-for-profit humanitarian organization committed to serve, educate, and empower undeserved communities. So through their programs, they want to break the cycle of poverty, and they have trained over 400,000 students and established over 100 training centers in the sectors of education, technology, mental health, and renewable energy. Our next uh, partner for Suara Masyarakat is the SINA project. It's a civic technology initiative using open technology, open data, and policy analysis to systematically make import, um, important information public and, and more accessible to the Malaysian people. It aims to improve governance and create and encourage greater citizen involvement in the public affairs of the nation by making parliament and Malaysian government more open, transparent, and accountable. And next, uh, our partner is also from the Center for Independent Journalism, which is a non-profit organization that aspires for a society that is democratic, just, and free, where all people will enjoy free media and the freedom to express, seek, and impart information. So about this webinar, um, the reason that um, Internews in Malaysia is organizing this together with the European Union and National Union of Journalists Malaysia is um, to mark the World Press Freedom Day, which was held on uh, May 3rd, on Sunday. And we wanted to give, um, to provide a lens to the humanitarian and community related impacts of COVID-19. And this webinar is also a series of World uh, Press Freedom Day webinars by Internews, which has partnered with BBC Media Action, Translators Without Borders, and Evidence Aid as part of its wider uh, connect COVID-19 efforts to improve access to quality information in a crisis. This resource is funded by the H2H network. 
And why did we choose this topic? So more than ever, we need fact-based and responsible reporting by the media who are among the frontliners during this COVID-19 pandemic. And due to a rapidly evolving situation on this public health crisis, media practitioners, including those in Malaysia, have a role to play in providing coverage that's relevant, accurate and informative, especially since this information will impact some um, communities. So journalists are also facing additional challenges during this time in terms of combating the spread of rumors, disinformation and responding to the infodemic. So let me introduce you to all of our speakers. Okay. Let me invite Ida back online. Right, so let me introduce um, all of you to our speakers. The first one is Dr. Dr. Ahmad Faisal Muhammad Perdaus, who is the president of Mercy Malaysia. And Dr. Faisal has been the president of the NGO since 2009 and has rendered assistance to disaster areas and conflict-stricken countries, including Aceh, Syria, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines, among others. He is also a consultant specialist at the KPG Damansara Specialist. And next, we have Lo Fun Fong, who is Assistant News Editor at the Star Media Group. She is a health reporter uh, and is currently covering COVID-19. She has a Master's of Science in Journalism from Boston University and received her Bachelor of Communications majoring in Journalism from USM and is a WHO Journalism Fellowship recipient. Fun Fong has over 25 years of journalistic experience and is interested in health policies, systems, and access to medicines. And our final speaker, Ida Jus, she is the Internews Global Health Advisor. She's based in Durban, South Africa. And she's an award-winning journalist, media technical expert, and season manager with over 25 years experience. Her journalistic work across Africa has focused on science, governance, and human rights issues with an emphasis on HIV-related and analytical storytelling. She has been in leadership positions of both newsrooms and media development projects since 1996. All right, so I think we can Straight away, go to our first speaker. Um, let me invite uh, Dr. Faisal. If you can unmute your audio, please. Thank you, Nadia. All right. Um, I'll, All right. I'll be so, quick and brief okay. As, okay. as we have only 10 minutes, I think. Yeah. So but thank you, I Nadia. Have, and maybe I can and, um, yes. just uh, introduce your topic today. Oh, yes, please. Read the question. Okay. So as a medical practitioner so, and humanitarian, um, can you discuss the importance of having press freedom in terms of delivering transparent, open and accountable health reporting, especially on data sharing? And how does that impact both the local or national management and response and preparedness towards this pandemic, especially with the whole of society approach that is necessary? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Um, as I said, I'll be brief in my response. Um, Basically, we have this greatest challenge of our lifetime uh, currently around this, uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, however, it has also brought out certain uh, issues, but also certain opportunities um, for us to look at. And first of all, of course, is the fact that in this pandemic, information and data sharing is becoming the norm. And, and sharing of information is actually key to the whole of society approach. Without information sharing, there is no whole of society approach towards tackling the pandemic. So from a healthcare and medical provider uh, perspective, uh, there is no way at all that uh, this pandemic can be addressed even, even slightly uh, without information sharing. Um, this is even made more so relevant, of course, by the fact that we do not have yet any effective treatment uh, that is effective at all phases and all stages and all types of the infection, as well as there is no yet any vaccine either available now or immediately near on the horizon. So having information sharing as being central to any strategy in tackling this pandemic is key. Now, information, of course, comes from people who have information. So who are they? They are the people with the data, the people with the um, with the available information about who, how many, where, and when people are being infected, as well as those who have done a little bit more uh, and have information on how the disease has progressed in different types of situations 
and how it affects people in different ways. So the government and authorities, of course, have a um, have the majority of the information at their fingertips at the moment uh, in whichever country this pandemic has hit. It's becoming very, very obvious that uh, the daily sharing of information by health authorities in every country around the globe is becoming the um, one stop center, if you like, uh, uh, for everyone uh, to share and also to gain whatever information and knowledge there is on the current state of the epidemic in that particular country. This is where uh, the accuracy of the data and the, uh, and the uh, truth of the information that is being shared is so, so very important. And so far, here in Malaysia, at least, uh, we are very, very fortunate that at least uh, as of the moment, uh, we see that our Ministry of Health and, uh, and especially the top management team and the infectious uh, diseases control team have been able to come up with information as well as data that are both genuine, uh, worthy of belief, as well as trustworthy. I think all these are, are very, very important characteristics. There is no attempt to hide data. There is no attempt to sugarcoat information. There is no attempt to say things which are not there, uh, but are there, or there, but are, but are actually not there. Now, uh, in, in most other countries, the same is being practiced. However, we can also see uh, that in some countries, there are differences in how the daily presentation of the, of the statistics and the data uh, are done. And in some countries, unfortunately, uh, there is a lack of transparency as to how the data is being presented. In most countries, however, I must say, thus far, uh, we are seeing good transparent uh, information sharing uh, with regards to data and statistics where, with regards to COVID-19. Now, um, is, that, is that all that is, uh, that is required? Um, in a normal circumstance, perhaps, but, uh, but not, in, not in the case of a pandemic as, ser as serious and as, and as uh, impactful as, as this one. It's very important then that every country in the world allows for an open and free media that can ask questions, can inquire, can challenge um, the data, even though it's believable and trustworthy, and can challenge the authorities' actions uh, as a result of the data that is being presented. Um, this can be both from a healthcare perspective, public health perspective, as well as a social perspective. Um, and, and sometimes, of course, as we have seen uh, over the last two weeks, especially from an economic perspective, as the impact of COVID-19 economically uh, is now definitely much, much more felt uh, throughout the globe uh, and affecting much more, uh, many more people uh, in so many different ways um, and arguably a lot worse than the effects of the infection itself on the majority of the population, seeing that, of course, that uh, we are looking at uh, rates of infection that are still relatively per country in most countries, not too high and uh, death rates, uh, which also are not, or case fatality rates, which are still not too high in most countries, although there are exceptions. So having an open and free media that's, that's able to discuss and, and having a, a good interactive platform uh, with the authorities, either during press conferences or having an information being made available after that is key. And here in Malaysia, we are fortunate again, I think, that the Ministry of Health shares the daily uh, press conference transcripts, but also updates um, uh, on social media, uh, via Telegram especially, uh, the latest summaries of the data, etc. And this allows for, for the press uh, to actually have access to information directly and indirectly. Um, there is perhaps um, one particular area which the government, um, the governments around the world uh, could actually be better at, which is uh, perhaps timeliness of the information share, uh, apart from the accuracy. Uh, the accuracy, as in most countries, as in Malaysia at the moment, uh, is, I would say, pretty accurate uh, as per the, the details that are presented daily. But perhaps timeliness can be improved. And, um, and, in, and, and this, this refers to 
um, the, the time when the data is actually shared as to when it is, it is actually collected. There are, of course, some challenges, like test results don't actually, if they are RT-PCR tests, don't actually come back on the same day, etc. Yeah, And there are logistics problems. But on a whole, uh, uh, the timeliness of the information being shared is also important for decision making. Now, what then for the media, um, having this now uh, 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 environment whereby information is widely and accurately and hopefully timely shared by authorities all, all around the world. Uh, the media, I think, has a responsibility, first and foremost, in a situation like this, to verify the data and to actually come up with, um, uh, with uh, news and articles when they are published that, um, that not only reflect um, the data as in numbers, but also an understanding of what they mean. And so verifying the data, asking what lies behind the data actually, and then presenting it in, in either written or uh, a, a, a verbal form, uh, depending on which uh, type of media you're, you are, uh, is actually as important perhaps as the data itself. And sometimes, of course, the explanation and the and the inquiry or the answer to a question behind the data uh, can be answered or can be given uh, from the information that has been delivered. But sometimes you may need experts to come in and give some more verification as to what the data actually means. So. Um, at present, I must say that in Malaysia, uh, the situation is fairly good. Uh, it can improve further. Uh, we hope it will. Um, but uh, but as as we stand now, there's there's perhaps that a little bit more uh, tweaking and improvement that's that's needed uh, on the part of the authorities in terms of timeliness of the data on on the part of the media. Um, better understanding of what the data actually means. And then therefore, because uh, the impact is great, actually, what the media writes or publishes the next day after the data has been presented can actually, in no small way, influence, uh, for example, government decisions. And uh, because, of course, the government will be very sensitive to how the people will think or accept uh, uh, explanations. So I'll stop there. Uh, there, is, uh, there is also another aspect which uh, which uh, I would like to touch upon later, uh, if time permits, which is on the humanitarian angle and the humanitarian aid aspect uh, of this crisis and the importance of media freedom there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Faisal. Okay, thank you, Dr. Faisal, for session. So next we'll have... So next um, we'll have... Um, thank you. So just to so um, just to um, go into her session, um, her session Dr. Um, Faisal mentioned Dr. Faisal a lot about data, data and making sure this information, this information is, is accurate and timely. Accurate and timely. So as a so reporter, as a um, reporter um, so what's the importance, so what's the importance of, of um, using very clear and very clear and precise, precise language to precise communicate? Language to communicate. Um, so, because journalists need to communicate so much technical information on this pandemic, such as patterns of transmission and rate of contagion and your know, nature of this virus itself to all layers of society. Um, a lot of them are, you know, non-medical um, readers. So can you explain maybe the importance of language for effective communication um, to provide basic information in keeping, you know, our community safe and healthy and also how this um, approach can counter misinformation uh, and fake news and hold these people accountable as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, since we have only 10 minutes, I will just share uh, very briefly on uh, some simple three, three, just three factors that I usually apply even as a journalist. Okay. Um, the importance of using clear, precise language and facts to prevent panic. Yeah. And uh, there is still, there are still many aspects of the SARS CoV 2 that we do not know about. And there are certainly a lot of fears out there. For this reason, it's important for journalists to explain clearly any new development or findings relating to the novel coronavirus disease or known as COVID 19. For me, Okay, like I mentioned just now, there are three key aspects for writing. First, we must get the facts, verify them, and then show the facts to the people. 
And then we should try our best to use the right terms to describe the situation we are in and then put them in the right context because even the right words in the wrong context can mean different things and can cause panic. You know, the hope, you see, the World Health Organization has said that, say for instance, uh, the World Health Organization has said that the virus that causes COVID-19 is mainly transmitted through droplets. When a person coughs, sneezes, or speaks, the, the droplets are too heavy to hang in the air and quickly fall on floors or surfaces. So you can be infected by breathing in the virus if you are within one meter of a person who has COVID-19 or by touching contaminated surface and subsequently touching your eyes, your mouth, you know, before you're uh, washing your hands. But despite all this explanation that has been going out, right, people are still uh, kind of uh, uh, worried whether the disease is spread by droplets or airborne. I keep getting this being raised, you know, even among non-media friends and uh, so many people kept asking me this question. So I thought it's good that we address this. And um, so, so when, for instance, right, um, uh, last month, in, or rather in March, there's a US-based news site that has an article with a title that seems to raise some anxiety. The title runs this way, yeah? WHO considers airborne precautions for medical staff after study shows coronavirus can survive in air. Okay, then all these people who are what in the WhatsApp group, you know, WhatsApp chat groups ask whether, you know, is that true? Has WHO now come out and say that it's actually airborne? Then that's really dangerous and people are worried, you know, and um yeah, and we even have the image of Dr. Tedros being put on in the and on that image, you know, and uh, it's as though he he is the one endorsing it. But but actually, he gave a statement uh, explaining that it's only certain procedure, and he's reminding doctors to be careful when carrying out certain medical procedure. So. You see, with uh, 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 that WhatsApp being circulated, you know, uh, 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 there, there is some level of concerns, anxiety and all that. But when I actually search and click on the article on the website, and it turned out that there is actually such a, an article. And it explained at the later part in the article that airborne transmission may be possible in certain settings where medical procedures or treatment are performed and which generate Aerosol. So the story itself is okay, but the title seems to cause some anxiety. La. So could the confusion and fears be avoided if the title is made uh, clearer and uh, that airborne, you know, uh, phrase uh, part be uh, referred to a certain medical procedure? That means it's more targeted, you know. But um, you know. For news media, sometimes they want to sensationalize things with the title and then the rest, you read it yourself. But we need also to be careful as to not to cause confusion and panic in the way we phrase those uh, uh, words in, in the title. Because title plays an important role in, in, in even like for a lot of people because sometimes they don't even read the article. And that's bad, actually. They should read the whole article before jumping to conclusion and before whacking the, the media or hitting on anyone, you know? Okay, that's another example that I want to share, like common phrases that I often see, you know, uh, in, in media report. Uh, sometimes you see writers describing the coronavirus as the deadly coronavirus or the killer virus. Um, is that... Is that an accurate description? I would imagine that this kind of description uh, would mean that every person who is infected is, uh, the, uh, with the virus, they will die, you know? But if we look at the facts, uh, we find that it is contagious. Yes, very contagious. But from reported cases in Malaysia and worldwide, 80% have mild or moderate symptoms and some, you know, uh, uh, don't even have symptoms. So we, as uh, journalists, as journalists, we can educate people by empowering them with the right facts. So yes, it is contagious, but um, you see, all these people are also infected. But at the same time, we need to take measures to protect ourselves. 
you know, by physical distancing, not going out unnecessarily, wearing masks and washing hands frequently, and doing all the the necessary, uh, uh, I mean, uh, having all the necessary safeguards. So, in other words, we have to keep reminding reminding people that they cannot let their guard down. Okay, and journalists can play a role creating awareness about the need for the stronger to protect the weaker. Most people may not be affected severely by the disease, but they still need to take precaution and protect the old and those with weakened immune system because they could pass the virus to them and cause them to suffer severely or die. A writer by the name of Karin Wa Jorgensen, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, she wrote, the article, Feeling Panic About Coronavirus. Media coverage of new epidemics often stokes unnecessary fear. She wrote this for the Neiman Lab and did a research which suggested fear that had played a vital role in the coverage of COVID-19 outbreak. She tracked reporting in major English language newspapers around the world using the LexisNexis UK database from January 12 to 13, when reports first started circulating about the new uh, uh, illness. And this include 100 high circulation newspapers from around the world. And all these uh, stories that she's been tracking is like 9,387 stories. They are not, they are that many stories about the out, out, uh, outbreak during that time. And of these uh, stories, right, more than 1,000 actually mentioned fear uh, or, or, or related words, including afraid. She said 50 articles used the phrase killer virus, and one article uh, in, uh, in the Telegraph newspaper described scenes on the ground in Wuhan shared on social media. And you listen to this. Mask wearing, patients fainting in the streets, hundreds of fearful citizens lining cheek by jowl, jowl at risk of infecting each other in narrow hospital corridors as they wait to be treated by doctors in forbidding white hazmat suits, a fraught medic screaming in anguish. That's really dramatic, right? So, um, so on the one hand, like, um, uh, journalists want to attract readers. On the other hand, you know, we also need to be cautious like, with these things. And by the way, hazmat suits are used for uh, addressing uh, 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 in situations where there are toxic chemicals. Okay, then the tabloid newspapers have been more likely to use fear-inducing language, according to Karin. So in conclusion, words do affect people's state of mind and thinking, and we should be very careful and also be responsible, uh, very, be very responsible in how we write uh, our news, uh, and that journalists need to play an important role by putting things in perspective for readers during this COVID-19 crisis, by checking and presenting facts without causing unnecessary panic or anxiety because uh, our mental health uh, uh, yeah, is also equally important in this respect. While having the right facts will enable people to empower themselves and protect themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Phun Fong. So um, before I introduce our next uh, speaker, I'd just like to remind everyone who is um, you know, uh, who has uh, uh, kindly participated in this um, webinar. We have a polls section that you can also submit your answer and then we probably will discuss the results at the end of this webinar. And also there's that green tab where you can see example from the Telegraph. So this button is basically for the resources and the links um, that the speakers are um, mentioning while they're speaking. So you could click on that as well, okay? All right, so on to our next speaker, Ida. So, um, so Ida, so when there's a new crisis like COVID-19, which is unprecedented in scale and comes with its own set of challenges, um, it's really tempting for media practitioners to reach out for fresh solutions. So in terms of providing health um, and safety information, do we always need to seek for new solutions or should journalists look to 
well-tested and well-rehearsed solutions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, hello everybody. I'm so glad about this conversation. I'm learning a lot and uh, I also don't know the Malaysia context very well, but I think what is reassuring to me is everything that I've discussed with my colleagues, with Nadia and others, and that um, the other two speakers have said sound so familiar compared to um, how I've been watching the trend in the rest of the world. And that's a very good question because I think at the beginning of the outbreak and up to today, because it hasn't been that long at all, we are absolutely overwhelmed with the amount of new information, the sheer scale of new science news. I mean, all of that is actually growing exponentially in the same way that the virus is growing exponentially and in waves across the world. Uh, you know, we first started uh, learning about faster than ever vaccine development. And of course, we've had a lot of misunderstanding about that because perhaps people who don't know vaccine development don't realize how long it usually takes to develop a vaccine, in some cases, decades, and some viruses vaccine development has been going on for decades without a vaccine. So a lot of news has been kind of literally bombarding us uh, from all corners of the globe, not just every day, but every minute of the day. So that's a sheer, um, there's sheer overwhelm just from the factual information uh, perspective alone, let alone information that is not, uh, that is misinformation. Um, so your question was, should we always, um, should we always have to reinvent the wheel and always find new solutions? Now, I think because of the overwhelm of the, of this um, glut of new information and new developments and new lifestyles and new fears, and new concerns, I think there's some comfort in the fact that as human beings who've been on this planet for a very long time, and we as journalists, who all of us have been practicing for some time, there are tools and approaches that have been around that actually do help us in this time, and actually perhaps help us specifically now when we need to feel anchored in some way in things that were known before and that still absolutely apply. So for instance, um, in fast evolving science, just like in slow evolving science, there are basic principles of science that remain absolutely true. Uh, the need for evidence to be sought, as Dr. Faisal has said, and the need for evidence to be clearly uh, communicated has always been there. The fact that scientists often communicate with a degree of um, caution has always been there. And that's because that's precisely how science works. We've noticed how information about the virus, for instance, about masks um, and the guidance that has come from the WHO has in fact changed over time. And we shouldn't be surprised about that because we're learning, scientists are learning new things all the time, things are evolving. So that's the great thing about science. Science is humble and adaptive to new insights. And that principle has always been there, but even that principle is now just on on fast forward. So, but if we think back to the principles and think back to HIV, where new guidance, new science has guided and HIV and of course any other disease imaginable. Um, new guidance tells us about new behaviors, tells us, of, us about new medicines, new ways of preventing and new ways of uh, immunization or vaccination. So that those principles are not new, they just feel overwhelming because they're happening, happening at such a fast rate. The other thing about, uh, the other thing that is not new, um, that has come our way, is the sheer scale of the misinfodemic. In other words, all of us um, have, in our lives, dealing with other health issues before, um, in our families, with our friends, we've all come across, you know, the aunt who thinks that absolutely, as long as you um, gargle with garlic, it will be okay. And of course, there are many iterations around the world, whether it's herbs, leaves, bark, or whatever uh, that people kind of want to grab to. We also know that that's not new. We've all heard um, opinion from people who are not virologists, not scientists, um, not medical doctors, about what it is that will make you feel, that will, that will cure you or make you um, healthy again in all of the other diseases around the world. And once again, that notion that has come forward that we find on WhatsApp groups, on Facebook, on Twitter, and in discussions is not new. But what is new is that there are actually, there's an amazing amount of new effort 
um, aimed at stemming this misinfodemic. And we as journalists should be thankful for that, because if it were only up to that, it would be an enormous task that would be impossible to bridge. So for instance, the large um, social media platforms have started to restrict um, the kind of information that's available, have started to kind of forefront information that is accurate, have started to guide people to, for instance, WHO and CDC sites, Centers for Disease Control sites, and in some countries also to the sites within those countries, which are providing you know, accurate and highly localized information that is credible um, to citizens. So that has always happened in the, in the nature of disease management, but again, it's happening also at an impressive scale how many more fact-checking organizations have come about? How many more new innovations we as human beings have come up to actually help to stem this tide of misinformation? What is not new about our, for ourselves, just even if we don't have access to, you know, if we don't perhaps have a fact-checking organization that we can immediately lean on, or if a new um, piece of information comes our way, what is not new and what can certainly help us as journalists, it may sound really old fashioned, but it's just stood the test of time, are the five W's and an H of journalism. So the who, what, when, where, and the why and the how are just as useful now and even more useful now than ever before. And especially the who part of it, because for instance, um, in journalism, we always ask, you know, the story is who did what, etc. And we all know those five W's and an H. But when it comes to sources, even in examining where we get our stories from, we should first of all ask who is saying this. Um, I can't imagine there's a single person here who hasn't had a sort of crazy message on their phone or on their Facebook or Twitter feed saying, how on earth can this person believe it? And we kind of forward that really quickly, sometimes just in shock, sometimes because we're so overwhelmed. But the most important question we should ask is, who is saying this? Is the person who is making this claim steeped in science? Is the person here, do they have um, our, our well-being as human beings at heart? Um, and then, of course, why are they saying this? Maybe they're saying this because they don't know better, but maybe they're saying this because they're malicious, or maybe they're saying this because it fits their agenda um, of, uh, of a conspiracy theory or of a certain political leaning. So the why people are saying this becomes even more important than ever before. It's never been unimportant. It's important in the tiniest story. And it is certainly very important in this massive global story that we all, are all attempting, uh, all doing our best at telling. So at Internews, for example, we have, before COVID happened, we had um, a component of our work was aimed at helping journalists and all of our partners report better on science and health. And I looked back at this guidance the other day and I thought, gosh, actually a lot of that actually is still applicable. Of course, we've updated the guidance because this health stroke humanitarian crisis is bigger than anyone we at Internews or any of us in the world have ever held, um, had to deal with, especially so rapidly. Um, and I looked at how much of that was actually still relevant. Um, we do that guidance uh, with journalists, with many partners around the world by, by helping people see how health information um, and accurate health information, timely um, health information can save lives or, or you know, at, at best, you know, in, in, a, in a very good scenario can actually save lives and in most scenarios can at least help people to make decisions that are for towards a better health for themselves and their family. So how we frame this is we say that good health information informs and it engages. So inform and engage is one of the pillars of our work. So inform is clear. There's a lot of new information and we as journalists must inform, but must inform in a way that is relatable, of course, and that translates the science, that makes it useful uh, for people. Uh, in other words, if we're too obsessed with the science of ARV therapy or uh, vaccine development and all of the new science that is based in um, in, uh, in genetics, etc. We may be learning a lot as journalists, but we may in fact not be helping our audience a lot. We may be putting science language into their um, into their inboxes and into their feeds that doesn't make much sense to them and at, 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 at the very least uh, might even um, give them false hope, for instance, of a vaccine. We know that how long vaccine development takes, and we don't know that the vaccines, the many vaccines in development now, will in fact be effective. 
So we must inform in a way that is useful to audiences. Not saying, I'm not saying withhold all this exciting science from them, but don't be fixated on that only. Rather be fixated on the science that is helpful. In other words, um, the science of social distancing, the science of hand sanitation, that's also science. And that's the science that at the moment is the only science that can um, help to save lives. We also have to engage our audiences because they have lots of questions. And by engaging audiences, that's a principle in humanitarian media, uh, which now really applies very strongly to health journalism as well, we get to hear what the questions are, what the frequently asked questions are, what the misunderstandings are out there. A second pillar of our health work is that we say we hold authorities to account. Um, in some countries, it's more difficult than in others. It depends whether the state is currently overreaching um, its mandate or not. But certainly where holding to account comes in, that's one of the pillars of journalistic work, is you know, indeed to see, first of all, what the new policies or the promises are, say, around ventilators or beds being made available or around testing, and then hold those authorities to account, to the very least to what they have promised, but also to, of course, with advocates and with other um, efforts, uh, you know, use our journalistic skills to push for more. Because there isn't a single country in this world where there is enough testing and where the health system won't be overwhelmed at some point. Well, some countries are very fortunate. They, uh, they have either practiced strict lockdown like New Zealand or their health systems are incredibly developed, but most countries do not have that luxury. And the third pillar of our health journalism work, which, which is, has been there before COVID and is still incredibly relevant, is to say that our reporting can shape and change norms. Now, I can't think of a more um, uh, relevant application of that, uh, of that pillar um, than right now in COVID-19. We're all already starting the, to use the term, what is the new normal? We are, um, in a way, all adapting to very many new norms, from the hand washing, from the distancing, from not hugging, from not, uh, you know, stay, not, not, from keeping a physical distance to those who are very close to us, to uh, new uh, burial practices and all of those very deeply rooted cultural aspects that are very difficult to navigate, but in fact had been uh, there before. So I think my time for now is up, but we'll talk a little bit more about what's new and what's not new and how the not new can help us navigate all this newness going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ida, um, for that. Um, I think we would like to go back to uh, Dr. Faisal. So um, earlier, Dr. Faisal, you mentioned um, on the humanitarian angle about you know the sharing of data, fair and open reporting on fair and open reporting on um, so, so in terms of uh, this aspect, uh, in terms of coordination and effective effectiveness of delivery aid to marginalized populations and what are the ramifications to communities um, if we have this big gap in, in, in journalism or in health reporting? Thank you. Um, thank you, Nadia. Um, well, first and foremost, uh, let me just say that, um, again, um, in general and as a whole, the openness uh, of governments and authorities uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic has been greater than in most other crises that we have had uh, over the last uh, 10 years, especially. Uh, and I guess that's understandable because, because uh, of the global impact and the nature of the, of the crisis we're facing with an invisible enemy and, uh, and without any effective treatment, any effective vaccine yet. So, um, the openness is perhaps also a sign of willingness to share uh, the burden as well as the information on the part of authorities. Now, there are exceptions, of course, but uh, if we talk about um, democratic countries and countries which have a reasonable amount of press freedom, uh, this is uh, currently the case. And in Malaysia, we, we see that, um, that in terms of the health reporting, as I alluded to in my, in my first section, uh, we are doing fairly well at the moment if we compare uh, the kind of uh, data sharing and, 
and uh, information sharing that, that has gone on in the past. Uh, this is definitely a vast improvement. Um, perhaps it is to do with the nature of the, of the pandemic. Perhaps also it has to do with the line ministry involved, which is the health ministry. Uh, perhaps uh, people in, in healthcare are, are a bit more open and, uh, and, and the fact that, uh, that the pandemic requires, uh, as, uh, as I said earlier, as well as I think Ida also mentioned and, and, and so did Kong Fong, requires participation, requires engagement from the public. Uh, therefore, authorities have practically no choice but to be open. However, from the humanitarian angle, uh, we still see uh, some gaps. And, um, and some of these gaps are, are, are perhaps uh, not so much uh, uh, the result of, uh, of not sharing data or information that is already there, uh, but perhaps it's more of a not wanting to uh, expose or, or talk about um, certain marginalized areas of, of society, certain marginalized populations, which exists in every society, in every country in the world. And of course, in a country, if that particular country has a larger number of, uh, of uh, vulnerable population and uh, a more diverse uh, number of vulnerable population, be they indigenous people, be they the very poor, be they isolated populations, and as in the case of uh, some countries, uh, they are migrant workers in large numbers, or in some other countries, uh, refugees. And in, in a few countries like Malaysia, we have all of the above. So uh, sometimes um, it comes with some baggage. Uh, and because it does come with that baggage, authorities generally have a, a little more tendency to not be as forthcoming as they would be. Uh, with data information regarding healthcare. So um, over here in Malaysia, uh, we can see that uh, there are three aspects perhaps that uh, from the humanitarian angle that can be very much improved on with, with more openness on, on, on the part of authorities and government, as well as more accurate and verified reporting from on, on the part of the media. Um, I must say that again, compared to say five years ago, uh, the press freedom we're enjoying now in Malaysia is, is leaps and bounds uh, ahead of what we were at in about five, six, seven years ago. However, um, I guess uh, it's the accessing the correct information where these vulnerable populations are, are concerned that is the difficulty at the moment. And verified uh, information is even more difficult. So the three areas are coordination of aid. That's number one. Uh, we, if authorities and government don't share accurately uh, the whereabouts, the numbers of vulnerable population, of, uh, of people who are isolated uh, in or cut off uh, from, um, from, uh, from communication or from, from, uh, from the mainstream because of their location perhaps, yeah? uh, or people who are from vulnerable groups like uh, undoc undocumented migrants or refugees, who may be afraid or wary or worried of coming out uh, to do testing, to be screened, etc., because they fear being deported more than, than the virus. Yeah? So uh, if, if uh, authorities don't share this information accurately, uh, then of course, uh, humanitarian aid also gets, uh, gets a little bit more difficult to deliver. And for humanitarian organizations, information is is key and vital to delivering aid timely and to the right vulnerable population. Um, it's also important to avoid duplication of aid. Um, we've seen over the last uh, six to eight weeks here in Malaysia, uh, before the MCO even, and especially during the MCO, uh, the, there has been an upsurge of people giving aid, which is fantastic. Uh, and apart from uh, aid, as well as uh, delivering support to frontliners, uh, there's also an upsurge of people and groups giving aid to vulnerable populations. But where uh, and, and who uh, are very important. And so sometimes we have, uh, we have an overflow of, uh, of aid being given in some areas and under uh, representation of aid in some other areas, and especially to, to some groups like refugees. So that's the first point. The, the second point is that, um, is that with regards to um, to the humanitarian angle, is that um, 
there is a challenge on the part of both uh, the narrative from the government as well as the narrative uh, from the media with regards to uh, with regards to a uh, especially uh, with regards to uh, how much is given where and where it's needed uh, and here I'd like to bring about um, the uh, the point that Fong Fong made about uh, about sensor sensationalizing uh, of news yeah and the fact that most people only really read the headlines uh, well, not most, perhaps a lot of people. A lot of people, unfortunately, only read the headlines. And uh, and here comes the importance of actually being, being uh, well, yes, well, we hope more people read the actual article. Uh, on the other hand, we can't deny the fact that having the right headline also sometimes is important. Um, we understand uh, that it's it's necessary sometimes for, for, for the press to up the ante a bit, yeah, in terms of the headlines uh, to get people's attention. But there's a there's a fine thin line between between getting people's attention and and sensationalizing something out of context. So um, uh, here we see the uh, the the importance of uh, both verifying data as well as verifying, uh, as Ida said, the source of information and uh, and and the way headlines are written and the way news are generally written. Or, or 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 presented. We at Mercy Malaysia ourselves have uh, have had, uh, have had experience of this over the last six to eight weeks. Sometimes the headlines uh, 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 don't actually represent uh, what is actually being written in the article, um, and then and then we've had to you know explain again to 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 the public uh, um, uh, regarding the actual news that's being uh, that, that's being conveyed so so this is this is important not just in terms of in terms of the the impact on the aid given but also on reputation of the humanitarian organizations involved as well as in more importantly perhaps uh, more importantly um, giving the true picture of uh, the vulnerable populations involved uh, because um, because an orang asli uh, village for example, uh, may be secluded, uh, and uh, and uh, the reason why uh, there's no aid yet to that village is probably because it's self-sufficient, and that uh, that uh, both authorities and humanitarian organisations have discussed and come to a conclusion that actually um, exposing potentially exposing them to the virus by having outsiders coming in in large numbers is probably a greater risk than actually uh, giving out a little bit of aid. Um, so, um, but again, if you sensationalize the 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 headline in the wrong way, then then the then the then the people will get the, the wrong message, uh, implying that you know um, they are purposely being neglected. That's just an example, and of course, which brings me to the third point, which I think um, this final point uh, is very very important in in the case of of our preparedness and response uh, towards COVID nineteen. Um, we can't deny the fact that this uh, pandemic is different from most of the other crises uh, that uh, that we've uh, encountered over the last decade or so, or even more. And um, two particular aspects is that sometimes people like to attribute um, uh, a, a blame or uh, even the affliction of the disease onto somebody else, yeah, and 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 because this is a transmissible, communicable disease, um, the uh, the natural instinct of some people would, would actually be to look for who is it that that transmitted this virus to me, yeah, and so then this brings the question of uh, culpability into play, yeah, and and this is a very very important aspect. Uh, the second point is of course the fact that. Uh, that because as both Hong Kong and Ida have mentioned, that so much is still unknown uh, about, about COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And al although researchers are working day and night, every day around the globe, uh, trying to find out more data and more information, there's still a lot more we don't know. Uh, and every day we are, we are given a new piece of information. Um, this leads to, as uh, I think uh, Hong Kong said just now, uh, and Ida echoed as well, to fear. And, and human beings, uh, you know, uh, are, are generally negatively spurred by fear, usually. 
and therefore the, this this last point of culpability and blaming and fear uh, then in the humanitarian angle what we've seen uh, is that um, the weak and the marginalized uh, usually get more than their fair share of blame and and sadly here in malaysia we've seen over the last few weeks how uh, refugees for example uh, have been uh, demonized and have been uh, blamed as a as a group that perhaps is culpable for this yeah of course there are other aspects as well uh, uh, of the refugee issue here in malaysia which i don't have time to go into today uh, but uh, the, the fact for example that malaysia is not a signatory to the uh, geneva convention for refugees is a particular major point yeah but uh, that's a separate issue actually but uh, because of people's fear and 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 and, and people's tendencies to to lay blame on others, uh, people who are weaker and in the vulnerable population usually get their unfair share of the blame. There is no evidence, for example, uh, to say that the uh, Rohingya refugees who've been particularly blamed um, uh, are, are responsible for any uh, mass transmission of the virus here in Malaysia. Um, a few of them did attend the uh, the public gathering in Sri Petaling, but then so many others did as well including uh, migrant workers from, from other nationalities, including, of course, mostly Malaysians. Um, but the way that, uh, that, uh, that uh, social media has reacted, for example, to some uh, news that has been, uh, in, in a way, sometimes inaccurately portrayed or reported, uh, has led to a wave of xenophobia, uh, which I think we've not seen for some time um, here in Malaysia. And, and uh, before COVID-19, um, uh, a lot of people knew about the fact that we do have um, um, refugees in Malaysia, although Malaysia is not a signatory to the convention, um, a significant number, close to 200,000 now in, in total, about half of whom are uh, Rohingya. Um, but uh, there was no big wave of xenophobia. Uh, of course, there will always be people who like or don't like other people. Uh, but there was no big wave of xenophobia. Unfortunately, this has come about. And, and some of it has been because um, the way uh, they have been portrayed. Now, the, I must say that, uh, that the responsibility lies on all sides. Uh, it lies with government to give accurate, the accurate narrative on this. Um, it lies with uh, uh, civil society organizations and humanitarian organizations like ours to actually come up uh, with uh, with the correct narrative also, uh, and of course, uh, for the media to actually play a role uh, in actually reporting accurately, um, uh, and especially with evidence. Uh, this will help to calm down temperatures and 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 to avoid uh, big waves of xenophobia. And and this is not peculiar to Malaysia. Uh, this is this this will be repeated elsewhere, everywhere. Uh, we've heard of uh, racially motivated attacks uh, uh, earlier on in the crisis against against Asians or Chinese looking people yeah in the West etc uh, being blamed for bringing bringing the virus uh, etc and of course that argument kind of died out when when uh, when the uh, when the covid 19 has become more or less under control in Northeast Asia especially in China and is now rampant in Europe and North America but then again um, um, people's uh, people's worst uh, vices and tendencies uh, as well as prejudices tend to come out when they are in crisis and in stress. And I guess this is where an open media is so important to get the right information, but also to report accurately and with the right narrative. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faisal, for touching on some very pertinent issues uh, there in your segment. So I'd like to go to uh, Hun Fong uh, to maybe explain uh, and share her experience as a journalist who is um, also a local level reporter, you know, covering COVID regularly now. Um, so in terms of challenges in, um, you know, in reporting freely uh, and in reporting accurately, uh, in terms of the issue of transparency, so what do you gather from the way you know, the authorities are um, communicating about the issues, uh, especially concerning our vulnerable communities, especially when you go to the press conferences and you know you um, write up these reports, you know, almost on a daily basis. Sure. 
Okay, before I delve into the issue, I will give you a brief uh, uh, explanation or a brief uh, introduction to Malaysia's, uh, 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 I mean, uh, situation in terms of press freedom. Uh, recently, Malaysia has shown uh, in the in shown a significant significant improvement in the Reporters Without Borders uh, 2020 World Press Freedom Index. You know, it went up 22 places to 101 out of 180 countries. Uh, there has been, without a doubt, an improvement in press freedom in the last one year, despite the many challenges that the press members have been facing. To put things in context, Malaysia's press freedom, freedom has come a long way since 1987, when uh, Operas, Operasi Lalang, you know, uh, uh, you translate it as weeding operation, which was one of the biggest arrests that have been made against dissidents under the Internal Security Act. So uh, at that time, in 1987, three newspapers were shut down for five months, and the Star um, is one of the, the media. By the time I joined the press as a junior reporter in 1992, it was not easy looking for information. The press had been muzzled. And with no internet, we reporters had to go to the minister's office or the interviewee's office if we could not get them through the mainline phone. And this is especially important if there are urgent issues that need uh, answers. Even if you get them on the phone, you, you often get hung up for asking questions. So, uh, so the, but the breakthrough in information technology had helped open up spaces for, for free speech to a great extent. The Malaysian media has gone through a lot of challenges and despite that, many journalists had tried to push the boundaries. It had uh, been a gradual but sure improvement in the last three decades in terms of getting the authorities to be more accountable, transparent and open to communicating with the press. From my experience, the health ministry has generally been uh, quite transparent. Uh, I deal a lot with the health ministry uh, and health related issues because since I'm covering a lot of health uh, stories, and because uh, health ministry is headed by doctors, it's natural for them to deal with facts. And I have been able to obtain the information needed even on some controversial issues. However, there may be times I may not be able to get the information I want, but I have my network of sources to tap into who can give the various insights and perspectives. Yes, uh, I do get scolded and hit hard at times by some government officials or even companies, but uh, no one has ever told me to stop my reporting. Uh, and in covering the COVID-19 pandemic, the health ministry, health ministry has been updating the public about the situation in the country on a daily basis. Uh, uh, the press is also allowed to ask questions. This, to me, provides a platform for the press to ask all questions on the coronavirus and the health and policy issues under its purview. On issue with regards to COVID-19 figures, some have questioned and even asked whether the reported figures we have are the real figures because not everyone was tested for COVID-19. Okay, uh, to put it in context, no country in the world have tested everyone or tested all their citizens but some countries have tested more than others. So they reported a higher number of cases. For this reason, the press must be aware that the Malaysian case cannot be compared with other countries that have carried out large number of testings and hence have higher number of cases. Is this an issue of transparency? This is an open debate, but I think this has got to do more with the approach that Malaysia takes. From my observation, the government's approach is to adopt the movement control order. So to a certain extent, whether people are tested or not, it is hoped that after the MCO, which is now almost two months, uh, and even if there are people infected, they would have recovered by now. 
Of course, the more severe ones will find their way to hospitals. But many pub public health experts have raised the concern on the difficulty in tracing undocumented foreign workers. And this can trigger massive, a massive spread if they cannot be traced. The health ministry then decided to work with the UNHCR to address the issue of refugees and the undocumented foreign workers. And I thought, this is brilliant. You know, and but recently the government decided to crack down on them, on the undocumented foreign migrant workers uh, who are actually locked down in two areas. And they, the authorities receive a lot of brickbacks for this. In the initial phase of the MCO, the government has said that the immigration uh, documents are not needed, you know, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. But you see, mass raids were carried out on May 1st. Anyway, on Monday, um, May 4th, the, our senior minister, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri, has defended the, more, the move to round out 586 undocumented migrants in Manara City 1 and two other flats, namely Selangor Mansion and Malayan Mansion in Jalan Masjid, India. He said that it was carried out for the well-being of the residents to ensure that they, are, they were fr all free from COVID. He had also later said that all foreign workers need to be tested and the cost will be borne by the employers. So meanwhile, the IGP, Inspector General of Police, Tan Sri Abdul Hamid Badur said the authorities are conducting large-scale joint operations to weed out illegal immigrants during the MCO as part of their efforts to contain the spread of COVID-19. And this was to ensure that they do not seek, sneak out from, iron, from the identified areas and spread the diseases elsewhere. So this, this uh, approach uh, caused a lot of, uh, raised a lot of questions and a lot of people are also concerned because um, you do, you, uh, the handling, because the handling of the undocumented workers you know, it's, it's not an easy task, understandably, for any authorities or country. But the recent rounding up could deter many from stepping forward for testing, knowing that they will be detained. This is worrying because it could lead to many others in the state and other states going into hiding and spreading the disease to other communities once the MCO is lifted. I think um, the authorities do try and uh, mitigate or to try and uh, calm down uh, the people by the, the explanation above. But I think they should be transparent in their efforts to contain COVID-19, you know, uh, especially with regards to refugees and uh, undocumented uh, foreign workers. This is important because if they want to gain trust, they, they must be more open about it and not target any group and perhaps they if they they would they could even think about giving amnesty at this time i think this is something that uh, the government will have to discuss and decide because clamping them down is not going to help the situation thank you Uh, thank you, Fun Fong. Um, so I'll go to Ida now. So we've mentioned MCO a couple of times, and I think uh, you also have, um, I guess, a, a general overview or understanding of the movement control order here in Malaysia. So it, with regards to this, um, so Malaysia has eased our lockdown um, yesterday, actually, but some states are refusing to comply. So in terms of the situation, it will definitely uh, differ uh, for journalists here, um, you know, depending on which states they are operating in. So what are some of the ways the journalists can remain safe, but still preserve the integrity of their work? Um, for instance, telling fact-based and transparent reporting during these times, um, during the MCO, and maybe to adjust to the, the new normal post-MCO as well. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, I think what Fun Fong just said is incredibly important about how um, we should not be blinded by numbers 
that relate to the number of cases in any setting whatsoever. We know that the, that there's a wide difference in testing, not only um, you know across the world, country by country, but even within states or cities for that matter. Um, and you know, once again, because this virus is invisible, um, and because we rely on the on the data that is available there may really be easily be a false sense of security in perhaps seeing um, in some cases numbers not rising dramatically at the moment or in some cases seeing figures which we perceive to be low when in fact the numbers are actually higher so the whole question of easing lockdown which happened as of yesterday in malaysia and of states having different uh, regulations presents an incredible dilemma for journalists, uh, an incredible dilemma. And I think the best advice I can think of is just be guided by the science. Don't be guided by the data that is available. And as Fung Fon and, other, and, and Dr. Faisal have said, it's not always that the government is to blame for the data not being available. Um, it's an incredible logistical task to, to roll out those tests even in countries where all the test kits are available the, uh, we also know in fact also that um, you know most of the testing isn't incredibly accurate at this moment again not necessarily um, the fault of any particular agency but uh, to related to the newness of this virus so the dilemma for journalists is now there are different regulations for different states now there is an easing of lockdown and now it's really easy for people to assume um, that our lives are more safe when already we know that scientists are looking at second waves of infection um, and in a pure science uh, perspective would actually in most cases would be to in fact continue lockdown as strictly as possible we know that it's not sustainable we know that many people suffer a lot through that as has already been said so what do journalists do with that dilemma i would say continue to be guided by the science hope that editors are also guided by the science and if they are not drag them into the science and the science is that human beings are vectors of this virus it's human beings that spread the virus if human beings didn't move if human beings didn't have contact with one another the virus simply wouldn't be able to spread and of course we journalists are human beings and the places the, the people we do where we do our stories is normally where human beings are gathered so um, the safest thing to do is to continue to work from home. Uh, the safest thing to do is, of course, also to uh, continue to ensure that the public around us um, understands how important it is to continue to observe those protocols that are, you know, at the moment, the only science that we know that can contain the virus. So uh, how can we solve this dilemma and still be credible? Yes, as I said in the first half of our talk that a lot of our response to this virus is not new. But of course, as journalists, much of what we are now required to do is in fact new. So we can't rely on, we know already that we can't rely on the traditional models of media and of media practices. So, but you know, there are also people who have really made a career, a startup career, of embracing mobile technologies for journalism. And if we're really honest, we actually, as journalists, tell stories a lot of the time to our neighbors, to our friends. Before COVID, we used to tell stories by simply sending somebody a WhatsApp picture or, or doing a voice recording and telling them about the nice weekend we had or the, you know, the celebration we went to or whatever the case may be. We may have to rely or to continue to rely on those practices that became far more widespread around the world when people start first first started to take lockdown seriously and there are luckily lots of tools out there and i think of something as simple as instead of being at the scene because we know that the scene isn't necessarily safe now just because lockdown is relaxed ask those who have to be at the scene to send you a picture do a telephonic whatsapp interview for that matter even for those who are at the scene for television, it's of course a particular challenge, but we also know that already there are award-winning award feature films that have been shot entirely on an iPhone camera. So surely broadcasters and journalists can also adapt and adapt to that and adopt far more of these technologies in order to be, um, you know, safe themselves, to keep their interviewees and those in their contact range safe as well, um, and then just still providing the news. 
So there's Facebook Watch Party, there is WhatsApp. There are all of the tools that are already available for us to gather news. So the, the role of a journalist has always been to gather news and then to make meaning of that news. To, in other words, synthesize the information, weave it together to make new meaning and to interpret what's happening to their audiences. That interpretation aspect is obviously still absolutely there um, and still essential and still possible for journalists to inform. It's the gathering side where we have to be really innovative. So use the best of social media, uh, which we're doing all doing anyway, because we live in this century. Use the best of social media and use that those as tools for your reporting, but add the meaning making layer to it. In other words, you would only be using information from your known contacts, not simply in anything that is um, shared out there or from known credible contacts and weave that into a new narrative. Um, and you know, that is becoming the new normal and many startup uh, journalists have made a name through this. Uh, you can search online, it's under mo mobile journalism or Moby journalism. Um, I know a current affairs, I mean, I, as, as you heard, I am South African. There's a current affairs television show in South Africa, because I think this is particularly journalist, uh, difficult for television, uh, which is basing all of its content, um, even, even though journalists are um, regarded as essential services, in other words, they may go outside even under extreme lockdown, they have decided to uh, base all of their stories simply on um, uh, material, television material that is gathered by remote, by we transfer file sharing, by asking their contacts to film something, and if the files are too big, to compress them and to decompress them. And lots of journalists have learned um, very quickly how to do their own editing, how to, uh, how to um, you know, use the tools that have always been available, but which we now urgently need and haven't actually needed before to you know, remain safe and remain credible. Because if we forget that we are human beings and that our chatting to somebody and the spit that comes from our mouths when we interviewing somebody or from their mouths, when they're interviewing us, because it's very possible to be infected with a virus and be unaware of it, to have no symptoms, and to be able to actually uh, be part of the train, chain of transmission. If we're not aware of that, we're not basing our response on science. It's new, uh, but it's essential for us, you know, in terms of the new normal. And it's also a very good way for us as journalists to set a good example in terms of how people are actually, unfortunately, needing to adapt in this time. Thank you, Ida. Um, so, yes, uh, I think, yeah, we've gotten to the end of the two segments of our um, speakers uh, presenting their talking points. And now we are going to the Q&A session. Um, let me just get Dr. Faisal back. I think he had some issues with his internet. Hang on. So how we'll do this is because we, we do have um, several questions here um, that you have asked. So we have 13. So we don't have enough time to address all of them. So what I can do is to select the ones with the most votes and we can actually invite the user uh, who actually posts the questions on screen. So if you are um, okay with that, then let me know. So for the first one, um, Chua Siu Ng, I'm wondering, are, are you keen to appear on, on the screen? Can just um, let me know in the chat box, if not. Okay, all right, cool. So I'll um, get you on screen. Hang on a moment. So. Let me invite you on. So, Sue so, Ng, um, I've um, sent you a, a link where you can click and appear on the screen. Oops. Um, We're just waiting for Siu Ng to go online.
I think there's some some connection issues with you. Um, it seems that you are not connecting to the screen. All right, it's fine. So I'll just read um his question. So it says here that um he's ask uh is asking, shouldn't we be concerned that Malaysia seems to be making the same mistake as Singapore in treating the health of migrants or refugees separately from the overall health of the population and invisib invisibilizing foreign workers? So where are the reports of the situation in the immigration depot centers where migrant workers run out on Labor Day are reportedly being detained? And for your information, the police are questioning the SCM post reporter Tashni Kumaran Tamao regarding her report of the rates. I think we did share the article that she wrote uh, on that. So, oh, Siu Eng is online, sorry. <laughs> Just notice you. Um, yeah, do you, hey. do you want to add anything to, to hi, Siu Do you want to add anything to that question or, or is that okay? Uh, I think Dr. Dr. Uh, Ahmad has more or less uh, mentioned that. Uh, address that and Tifong as well to some extent but yeah I'm just concerned that uh, there's no, no no additional reporting about that okay. you know and and the uh, harassment against the reporter uh, there's barely uh, there's not much solidarity uh, I don't see much solidarity I think that's important okay so maybe I can get um Kun Fong to address this first for you so I'll, I'll close your video and get her on on screen back. So, Wen Fong, maybe um, this question can be addressed to you first, and then if um, any of the other speakers have anything to add, um, we can also include their comments. So you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Journalists are quite concerned over this. Uh, um, uh, what you call questioning uh, with the S South China Morning Post journalists because um, until now, I mean, uh, more like I've been tracking this uh, issue two days ago and uh, there wasn't much explanation as to what was in the article that was uh, controversial, that was problematic. So I think for even for me as a reader, I would want to know what is the issue in the article because um, uh, she went and interviewed all these people, you know, and got uh, all this information. And if the report is uh, inaccurate or not, uh, is, is false or anything like that, then the authority should explain and give their side of the story. But um, so she was being hauled up. She has to go to Bukit Aman uh, tomorrow. Uh, so until now, we are for me. I mean, I'm not clear on on what's actually happening, and uh, this is uh, uh, it'd be good if uh, there's more explanation and communication on this. You know, uh, it's 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 not right, lah, for journalists to be just hauled up like that without knowing what what wrong we have done. You know. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ida, do you maybe have anything to add to that? Maybe just your experience on what's, what's happening, um, you know, whether presently or in the past with similar kind of health reporting. Um, yes, no, I, of course, I just completely uh, agree with Fun Fong, but um, just to say that maybe, uh, you know, it's journalism associations, editor groups, um, journalism advocacy groups, can always band together in a case like that and make a case more strongly than individual journalists but of course individual journalists also should continue to write about the issue because that is a tool that we do have but i definitely think i've seen around the world i mean it differs a lot from country to country but where this overreach of uh, and this over carefulness that is sometimes inappropriate um can only be solved if there are partnerships and if, if people who are advocating for freedom of speech get together and make a make a concerted effort so it's shameful but it's un unfortunately becoming common at the moment uh, thank you so we'll go to the next question um, this is by user yoga sm travel would you be okay for me to invite you on screen to read your question can just indicate in the chat chat box if you're all right.
Okay. <laughs> All right. It's okay. I hope you're wearing sarong or something. Um, but yeah, I think I'll just read the the question. So Yoga SM Travel is um, yeah, has put forward forward this question. So outside of the Ministry of Health Director General briefings and that of the Senior Minister Ismail Sabri, there have been very few opportunities to question the authorities with regards to developments in battling the pandemic and the economic fallouts from it. How does the media cope with the lack of avenues and opportunities to do so? Um, yeah, I guess this can go to you as well, Hun Fong, in terms of your experience covering the press conferences and also recent developments of how only state-owned um, kind of media are allowed to do this kind of press press briefings or to be at this to be present at this press briefing. Okay. Yeah. Um, on my part, I cover mostly uh, policies. So I may raise questions about, um, say, the, the last uh, combo articles that I've written, three articles, is about mass, mass testings, large number of testings, whether we really need that or not. Because, uh, you know, uh, on Monday, yesterday, the, the, the country has, uh, uh, what do you call, lift up part of the MCO. And the economy is open up to, to a great extent. So there is this concern whether, you know, we, we don't know who are, the, who are those who are asymptomatic. So, so I raised the question about whether we need mass testings. And uh, with that, I uh, went around asking various people, the public health experts, the employers, consumers association, and just, just anyone who may be relevant in this issue. And uh, I have also asked the health uh, director general, I, I, I text him, and he answered it in the question and answer session in the evening. So he has been uh, trying to answer whatever questions that the, the, the reporters have been uh, forwarding, you know. And uh, so with that, um, I was able to do the story and uh, to raise this question. And some people are for, for large testings and some are not. And both have their strong arguments, you know. So we leave it. I leave it as that for the authorities and also for people and even employees to decide how we should go, you know, how, how we should go about this because uh, mass testing is actually one of the tools we can use to try and monitor our own little groups, maybe in the office or in, the, in certain groups, um, you know, to do our part. Um, so this, this issue, um, the government has answered and they are just... Uh, interested in just doing targeted testings. That means they target high risk groups and locations where there are cases. This is uh, this targeted approach is good. It is good because then you get uh, to really narrow down with the limited resources that you have. You are more targeted in your approach. But there is again, like I say, the concern of asymptomatic issues. So there were other uh, people who said that more importantly you have to practice the social uh, physical distancing and other measures so in and to some extent um, when i deal with policies uh, raising questions like that i don't have much issue but i think like when you deal with more controversial issues like with the migrant workers or, or th uh, uh, yeah that that tend to create more attention uh, from the authorities and from people who are, you know, have interests as well. So um, I can only speak on my part in, in that sense. I didn't have any issues now. But I think other reporters who are covering other topics and other issues may face some uh, uh, difficulties. Okay. Um, I think I can have one question for Ida and then also for... Uh, Dr. Faisal, um, I think he is reconnecting. Um, I'll go for the question. Um, yeah, um, for Ida first. So, uh, one of the questions here it says the di um the daily public life briefings have also shown the capacity of some journalists in pursuing key information. How well trained are our journalists in covering this field, let alone this new disease? Do newsrooms prioritize capacity building of journalists to ensure they are able to channel the information responsibly? Oops, 
Yes, yes, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a very important question because I think uh, some of us mentioned and we all know that um, in the past it used to be that new science development or reporting on disease um, on public health was uh, in many cases uh, the reserve of journalists who are already specializing in science and health. Now I know all publications don't have the luxury of beats, you know, a politics beat, a sports beat, a business beat, and a health and science beat. But at least um, even if that uh, beat system isn't in place, we all know that sort of in reality, a certain journalist would be the one who would cover the main so uh, science story. Now, of course, everything is a science story and everything is a COVID story. So absolutely everybody from sports journalists to the journalists steeped in science are covering this issue. So no, certainly there are suddenly thousands of journalists in this world and of course many um, dozens i'm sure in malaysia reporting on this issue who had actually never reported on science before of course as a health and science journalist i see how that is impacting many journalists um, negatively because it is an area of specialization but at the same time there are also ways to overcome that um, if you go for an online search and you simply um, typed science 101 then some of the basic principles will be there and will help you. At Internews, we've also developed resources that are available uh, for journalists to do a quick guide through either science itself or COVID-19. And many other organizations have done the same because I think the realization is there that a lot of the misinformation and misunderstanding might not have been there if we just simply understood in general how science and health worked so um training is always important we always uh we all always have new things to learn but we have a lot of new things to learn around COVID 19. so i hope that you're all able to find opportunities and able to perhaps bring opportunities into your newsroom and obviously webinars such as such as these those are the new ways in which we're being trained at the moment and also watch out for a lot of the online courses that many organizations are now offering distance learning for journalists like uh, those on the line to join most of the time for free to learn actually specifically about COVID-19. So it's it's the fast and online way of learning at the moment, um, which may, you may feel is not ideal, but I hope also that in future it will entrench that um, very important idea about that it is important to learn about a subject first before rushing out or rushing into our computers to report on it. Thank you so much, Anit. Um, we are still waiting for Dr. Faisal. Oh, yes, he's back. Okay, great. Yes, Dr. Faisal, um, we would like to forward a question for you. So, um, one of the users here is asking, um, we've seen it with Singapore and now it's happening in Malaysia about the migrant population with the terrible living conditions would be a super cluster waiting to happen. My question is why are the authorities going back on their word for immunity if they come forward for testing? Now with the recent inhuman arrest, many of them have gone into hiding. Surely this is hampering any efforts to minimize the infection rate. So how, how would you respond to this? Yes. Um... the different, slightly different segments or communities that we're talking about here. And number one, there are documented migrant workers. Um, they number anything between, well, the, the, the department statistics say about 2.7 million at least. So um, 2.7 million, uh, 3 million around, around that. Yeah. Um, however, un, if you count the undocumented migrant workers now, that's when the figures balloon. Uh, to over 6 million by some accounts, at least. 6.7 million has been quoted um, as a number. Um, and so you are having at least one per one. For for every one documented worker, there is one undocumented foreign worker. Um, generally speaking, uh, I would think that the documented foreign workers have no issues, as we can rightly understand. Uh, they do not fear any um, immigration action or... or uh, action by the police. So uh, they should come forward. 
And with the latest guidelines uh, given out by the Ministry of Health as well as the Trade and Industry Ministry, um, where employers also have to follow certain guidelines uh, at their workplaces, uh, where antibody testing will be done and then followed by RT-PCR if there are any positive results or any negative symptomatic uh, persons. Um, for the documented ones, uh, that should not be an issue. But for the undocumented ones, uh, this is where the problem is. And, um, and I think the earlier announcement by the government, uh, especially I think through the Ministry of Health, um, it was actually made uh, at one of the press conferences uh, by the Director General Hisham. And uh, it was uh, stated very clearly that, uh, that uh, this was early on, yeah, early on. Um, and it was stated very clearly that uh, the Ministry of Health would like to encourage uh, people to come forward and there was another statement uh, that was uh, that followed that uh, that said that the uh, that the priority of the authorities was on uh, tracing and on testing and not on um, not on other action uh, this came not from the the health ministry but from but from the security cluster um, that however changed um, with uh, the recent action we've seen over the weekend um, and um, and this will have a negative impact. And it's not easy in Malaysia because um, unlike in Singapore, where number one, they don't have as many undocumented migrants, almost all of theirs are documented. And secondly, um, they are in large dormitories housed in, uh, housed in particular areas. Most of ours are not, uh, well, we don't have large dormitories as the system is in Singapore. The downside of that large dormitory system in Singapore, of course, it has seen a large spike of infections because uh, they are all close together. Yeah, um, And so Singapore's numbers have risen over the last one week dramatically. Uh, uh, but on the upside is that you are able to look for and locate and test, test almost everyone. Um, here in Malaysia, of course, they are dispersed in the community. They stay at accommodation which are uh, provided for by employers mainly, but some of them on their own, uh, and um, and these are usually cramped. But they are they are not in one place; they are dispersed. So this makes it very difficult. And sometimes there is a mix of between migrant and undocumented migrant workers. So I would actually agree with the view that um, that uh, we should focus on testing at this very moment, and um, and uh, and have all the other action. Uh, put aside until the until and unless the pandemic is under control. Now, um, there is also a natural selection that obviously will take place economically. Um, again, uh, because of the downturn, the expected downturn in the economy, with many businesses uh, having to go through some uh, amount of difficulty, if not a lot of difficulty, um, some of these migrant workers, uh, both documented and undocumented, might be looking to go back as well. To where, to where, to to their original countries. So um, this is this this uh, more uh, lenient approach would actually serve the health aspect of this crisis very well. Um, unfortunately, of course, the government has taken uh, a step in the other direction over the last weekend. And again, I put it to you as a matter of uh, of thought that uh, perhaps some of that government decision. Uh, had a little bit to do with the uh, with the rise in um, in in public sentiment, yeah, uh, and uh, and negative public sentiment towards towards foreigners. Although the target was mainly the Rohingya refugees of that of that of that xenophobia, but um, but you know, um, not many people can tell the difference uh, between a documented migrant worker from Bangladesh uh, and an undocumented one. And a Rohingya refugee, um, and 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 some of that decision, wrong as it may be, uh, or in our view at least, uh, on the government side, um, actually um, also stems from the fact that perhaps the pressure from the public reception uh, was also getting onto the government. We must understand that in democratic societies, unfortunately, public opinion matters, and uh, and Malaysia is somewhere in the middle, I suppose. Yeah. We're we're not yet there fully, uh, but we uh, we come along. 
to 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 public pressure, and, and this is uh, that I, that I guess we will have to deal with uh, as as time goes by. But my personal opinion, of course, um, is that the government should take a more um, a more open approach at the moment uh, towards uh, enabling people to come forward for testing, and also for the documented ones, of course, to have their employers do the preliminary testing, and if anyone found positive. I uh, would then undergo the RT-PCR. The only, um, the only uh, advantage we have, like I said, over the current situation in Singapore is that we do not have them all housed in these large dormitory-like uh, uh, like dwellings. They are dispersed. And so we don't have, at the moment, a, a, a big spike uh, in numbers. Um, but there have been, of course, small spikes, especially in the EMCO areas around Selayang and, uh, and, the, uh, and the apartments in Jalan Munshi Abdullah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fazal. I think um, maybe for our final question, I would like to forward this to all of our speakers. Um, this is concerning misinformation and disinformation. So the question is, um, in Malaysia, the amount of misinformation with regards to the migrant or refugee population is the worst of all. Why, is the, why are the authorities not doing anything to combat the stream of misinformation and disinformation? So um, perhaps for info, you can start off. Um, we can start off with you as uh, to answer this question. Hmm. Not sure how to answer this question. Um, Are there maybe any? Yeah, I think. Uh, Maybe any like mm -hmm. things that you've observed um, just covering COVID, uh, whether there are any positive developments, for instance, that um, you see are being carried out, um, you know, in the media landscape on how they are combating misinformation or disinformation, or do you feel like um, there's lack of efforts basically um, on this front? Um, I think the authorities in general, they are, they, they act based on complaints, and they act based on some information. Maybe we don't know. Uh, but I, I also find that the recent trends a bit bizarre because I find that generally Malaysians are very compassionate towards uh, migrant workers and you know even the undocumented ones. But suddenly there's like a sudden turnaround. I find it like uh, it's just out of the norm. You know, and I don't know whether there are cyber troopers involved. I'm not. I'm not IT savvy, but I think people should start uh, looking into the role of cyber troopers in in uh, influencing our perceptions. I may be wrong. I don't know. Someone who has uh, IT background should check into this. And if there are any interferences, then this has to be brought to light and perhaps you know stop and uh, those who are involved may uh, instead of using that method whoever is using it should learn how to engage with people rather than use uh, think tactics that are not uh, not uh, you know welcome you know not not good so i i don't know how don't exactly know how to answer this question yeah but uh, this is just my observation I think you answered it quite well, actually. Um, it's good to get your perspective on this. Um, so I'll go to Ida next. Um, what, what can you say about maybe this uh, fake news or misinformation and maybe some examples, perhaps, that you've observed, whether independently or state-led, um, you know, state that um, are actually you know, trying to sort this problem out, basically? Thank you. Uh, well, as you know, I don't know the Malaysia context um, in in any way as well as all of you do but i would say maybe just from a global perspective yes like fun fong i want to say it is alarming uh, some of the instances of misinformation and also xenophobia as dr faisal has previously mentioned that we now see i think perhaps maybe offer just more of a, a philosophical explanation which is i think that under um, circumstances of extreme pressure they can bring out the best in, in good people and the worst in bad people um, I think. And then if you add to that uh, prominent global leaders who do stoke xenophobia, who have over the past years 
made to seem it acceptable to do othering and to think in a nationalistic way. I feel, um, I think around the globe, um, there is this recognition by some who look at the world not in a global manner, who do not look at the world compassionately and look at the world, world um, nationalistically, to feel themselves um, validated or vindicated uh, in a most alarming and, and, and upsetting way. And of just feeling, well, it's how it is. It's each to their own. Um, it's driven by fear, but it's also driven, I think, by the fact that there are irresponsible global leaders at the moment who are not helping with this um, Ubuntu, as we call it in South Africa, which is the togetherness. We are, in fact, incredibly together through this virus. But unfortunately, um, it has led to, uh, uh, I would say, an it's also very difficult for me to answer this because it's so incredibly sad um, and it's so incredibly important for us as journalists to keep a watch on um, a drift away from um, holistic and global principles and compassion, as uh, as uh, Fun Fong has mentioned. So that would be my explanation. Um, it is uh, something, it's another layer of importance uh, for our work as journalists to promote those voices that um, that steer us in the right direction. In other words, away from othering, away from um, making marginalized people be more marginalized than they already are. As you know, you know, you know, I'm a South African, and of course, we come from the history of apartheid, which is literally where every every group is apart and different, distant from another group. Um, in South Africa, I feel there's a rise of right-wing sentiment that we had not seen for a long time. Uh, you know, kind of those in opposition to our government's excellent, brilliant efforts. Um, and it's disturbing for so many to see, and I think we see that in the US for sure. We also see it in other parts of the world. It's as if this pressure pot is bringing out confirmation bias for many and bringing out uh, perhaps decades old um, hatred that they had been through decency, been able to suppress, um, the crisis is bringing it back to them. And yet we have an opportunity to go in the opposite direction because it's a pandemic. It globally affects all of us and it is it does not discriminate against any race or gender or even age group for that matter so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ida, um, for that very helpful explanation. So. I think this question um, seems to be lingering in a lot of people's minds. Are uh, we just before I pass the mic to um, Dr. Faisal, whom I'm hoping could possibly maybe wrap up um, just very briefly what your thoughts are on this question. But also um, just to mention that we did carry out a, a poll uh, and the question was, what would be the biggest challenge in health and humanitarian reporting in Malaysia? And majority of the votes, um, um, majority of people voted for rampant misinformation from various sources some contain rumors which can, can create panic and fear so i think this really goes back to um, our current conversation and maybe uh, perhaps dr faisal if you could um, perhaps uh, just share your thoughts on how this challenge can be met um, through humanitarian and journalistic angle and maybe what are the ways forward um, to address this Thank you, thank you, Nadia. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, I would like to agree and also uh, reiterate uh, our points earlier, uh, which is uh, this has come up as a result of a combination of fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear of the coronavirus, the fear of something that is uh, looking to be, uh, at the moment at least, uh, so difficult to defeat and overcome. Uh, and it's invisible, yeah? Uh, it brings out, uh, as, as, as Ida said, the worst and the best uh, in people sometimes fear. Um, secondly, um, the MCO and the economic uh, impact of uh, COVID-19, even before the MCO. Um, in Malaysia, of course, we have to understand that the, that the economic impact is probably going to be a lot worse than the health impact, as, as it stands at the moment. Um, there are countries like Italy, Spain, the US, where you could argue that the health impact is as bad, if not worse, than the economic one. Uh, but um, here in Malaysia, with our relatively... Uh, lower number of, of infections and, and very low uh, case fatality rate, the number of deaths. Uh, we actually have the health side, uh, thank God, uh, quite fairly well controlled, but the economic impact is, uh, I think, at least 
many times that of the health impact, if not if not a lot more. Uh, and um, and because of that, the pressures uh, uh, which were not there before uh, on both individuals and on communities uh, suddenly became more evident during, especially during the MCO. And and this is to go a bit to what Feng Feng said about uh, how how she finds it bizarre and that you know before this uh, we were very compassionate. We were very compassionate towards uh, towards refugees, especially towards the Rohingya. Uh, we had uh, we had segments of our society uh, going above, over and above the the, uh, the usual call of duty to help these people, etc. Uh, our our uh, perception as well as our acceptance of migrant workers, both both uh, documented and undocumented, um, was somewhat um, uh, a quiet kind of acceptance, if you like, knowing that. We depend on them for large parts of our economy, uh, and on the other hand, uh, preferring if somehow you know uh, we could digitalize and automate quickly enough so that we could we could have less and less dependence on 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 foreign workers. But never did we have any 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 obvious uh, xenophobic uh, major xenophobic uh, tendencies coming out in the open like this. So it's a combination of all those, um, and it's also perhaps. Uh, uh, a combination also of uh, suppressed uh, uh, feelings and prejudices, which, like Ida said, uh, come out uh, during these worst of times. Um, so a combination of the economic pressure, the societal uh, nature, uh, as, as well as individual traits and prejudices all coming together. And I will not uh, rule out uh, Fong Fong's point about uh, cyber trooping and cyber troopers, although um, I think with if you look at how it happened, um, uh, it was actually the Rohingya refugee situation that that, that actually be, that actually started it. Yeah, with the boat coming in from from the Bay of Bengal and then was turned back by our by our enforcement agencies, uh, which resulted in dozens of deaths uh, on on board in in the bay by by the time they landed in Bangladesh, um, and um, and this has uh, th this then resulted in some international criticism of Malaysia. Which then provoked some uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, um, some retaliation from Malaysians, yeah, especially those with a more nationalistic uh, outlook. Shall uh, shall I say? Then it was then uh, you know the stories about how uh, uh, the Rohingya and also some of the migrants had participated in the tablet gathering and all that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then. And then we had uh, one group of people who actually um, were against uh, foreigners coming in and, and, and foreigners being given treatment, etc., etc., uh, etc. In this in this country, uh, and uh, on the basis of who they were, uh, race, uh, and uh, and they were very xenophobic. And I must add to, to the point that uh, that most of these people who actually reacted were actually uh, were actually also Muslims. Who, uh, who would naturally, uh, you would think, would be sympathetic to the to the Rohingya cause, yeah. Um, and there was also another group, however, uh, both both uh, among our Malay and non-Malay population, Muslim and non-Muslim population, who took a slightly different angle. If you were to go through social social media and look at this, and they were actually um, protesting more from the from the fact of of the healthcare provision that that we have that we are struggling against the pandemic and that uh, and that uh, their main point was that government and taxpayers money shouldn't be used for foreigners etc not so much as xenophobia but more of uh, you know it's us and them and our right and their right kind of thing so um so um that's how it got it there and then it, it then it became conflagrated with uh, with fake news and, and misinformation and and this is where again um if we look at the pattern, um, the government has been fairly good, and especially the Ministry of Health has been fairly good in countering fake news, myths, as well as uh, fake remedies, etc. Uh, when it comes to the medical side, yeah, when it comes to the medical side, and they do it forthcoming with, with a with, with a vigor, I, I would say. Uh, but when it came to the to the uh, issue around the around the refugees, especially the Rohingya, and now extended on to the migrant workers. We find that the response from uh, from authority here has been less uh, forthcoming and uh, less willing to perhaps being seen to uh, 
uh, take any stance that is looked upon as defending uh, the uh, the uh, the Rohingya and the uh, and the migrant workers. So much so that civil society groups have had to come forward, and then these civil society groups who come forward are then uh, then attacked uh, on the social media. Again, the press, I would agree very much with Ida on this. The press um, has a very big job here, which is to write and, and report correctly and with the right narrative and to try and steer as we can never be totally uh, uh, um, devoid of racism in this world, unfortunately, yeah? uh, or any form of racialism. Uh, I think that would be uh, quite an impossible thing to ask for. Uh, however, uh, we could steer people away from there into a more cohesive and more humane direction. And I guess that's where, without taking sides, uh, obviously, if, if a press, for example, in Malaysia, suddenly becomes too pro a refugee or pro a migrant worker, then uh, it may not help as well may not help as much as being objective, uh, being trying to be try to be impartial, but at the same time steering the, the conversation towards a more a better humane path. Um, with regards to uh, a, a wrap up, I would say that Sorry Dr. Faisal, your internet is um, breaking up slightly. Oh, actually, now you, your image is frozen. I think we've lost Dr. Faisal. Um, hang on. Okay, as for his mysterious um, summary of this webinar, I think I'll just go ahead um, with wrapping up this session um, just for the benefit of everyone's time. Um, so firstly, I just want to thank all the speakers today for, for, your, tri for your time. It has been really tremendous uh, learning from all of you and for your valuable insight um, into this topic of humanitarian and health reporting during COVID in Malaysia. So um, thank you so much to Fun Fong, to Ida, and to Dr. Faisal. Um, it was really lovely having all of you today. And also to all of the participants who tuned in from the start to finish. Um, thank you so much for your interest and for your participation. And um, lastly, I think it's fair to say that you know, we really need to invest in local level journalists in, you know, having press freedom for local media and to ensure that we put communities at the heart of any kind of health and medical reporting that we do. Um, so with that, I think uh, we can sum up this, uh, we can finish or wrap up this webinar. And I just want to inform those who are online that uh, we will provide the video through our online platforms. Um, we will announce that uh, later in the week. And we will provide also uh, Basel Malaysia subtitles. I'm very sorry that we couldn't do that for you live today, but we will um, have those uh, subtitles for you um, in our video that we will post uh, after this event. So thank you so much, um, Ida, Fun Fong, and Dr. Faisal again for your time and have a good day. Yeah, and Samak Berbuka to everyone. Bye.